to the Explorers Club. Oh, hello. Look at us. We have volume. One, one, two, check, check. Okay, turn off your phones, please, for a moment. Yeah, yeah, actually. <laughs> I always forget to say that. Yeah, I think it was. There it is. Now it's party time.
I'm passing back. <laughs> You're trying to get up. Wow, Alex, that's impressive. Hello, this is a round of applause for all of you for making it out tonight. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So to all of you here in the room and to you, all of you tuning in online, welcome to the Explorers Club. Um, I'm gonna ask for the people that are here with us in the Clark Room to make sure your cell phones are turned off. But other than that, we are really excited. We have a really great evening for you guys. Um, my name is Natalie Cash. I am the executive video producer at the Wildlife Conservation Society. I'm also a member here at the Explorers Club and am proud to serve as a co-chair of the club's newly constituted conservation and Sustainability Committee, and I would like to shout out my colleague, uh, co-chair of the committee, and board member of the Explorers Club, Martin Graus, who's here with us tonight. <laughs> here with his family. Um, he's such a great ambassador for the club, for its mission and its history, and he could probably do this uh, little ramble about the club uh, 10 times thousands better than I am. So if you have any questions uh, about the club and its history, Martin is your guy. How many people are here for the very first time in the club? Oh, okay. And Eric, too. Okay. And how many are members? Okay. So here's what you do. Look at these hands. Keep them up, people. If you're very lucky, you like, if there's time, follow a member down to the members' lounge where they can buy you a drink after this talk. Because it's <laughs> very, very swank. Very, very swank little place. <laughs> so. Um, but to tell you just a little bit more about the club, the club was founded in 1904 um, by a group of the leading explorers of that era. And today there are over approximately 3,000 uh, members in about 60 countries around the world. Um, and members, you know, they do conservation, exploration, science everywhere around the world and in outer space. Um, and they, you know, you'll see flags all around the room. They take these flags on registered expeditions and um, have bring, bring them back to file their, what they've uh, discovered. And some of the flags get retired. They've been to so many places or they've been someplace so notable that uh, the number gets retired. So I just wanted to point out a few that are in the room um, because right there, uh, a across from me here is uh, the flag that uh, Roy Chapman uh, and took and uh, that was the basis for the Indiana Jones character in Raiders of the Lost Ark. So there, before there was uh, Indiana Jones, there was Roy. Um, over here is uh, 123 that Thor Heyerdahl took on the Kontiki expedition. Um, and unfortunately you can't see, but the, uh, afterwards when the screen goes up, would love for you to see like the Apollo flags. There's also 161 behind the screen, which went to the highest point on our planet, Mount Everest, and as well went to the lowest, to the uh, Marianas Trench with uh, James Cameron who took it there on Challenger Deep in 2012. And, you know, I'm with WCS and, and, and the Explorers Club. One of the things that we have in common is William Beebe, who in 1934 went to what was then the deepest part of the ocean. He went a half mile down in a submersible called the Bathysphere, and that was an Explorers Club expedition. So we kind of have a long history going uh, back together as, as organizations dedicated to science, exploration, conservation, and uh, the preservation of the planet. Um, so to tell you just a little bit more about WCS, if you're not familiar with us, um, we're a global conservation organization founded as the New York Zoological Society in 1895. Like the Explorers Club today, we are you know, around the world. We work uh, in the largest wild places around the world in 14 priority regions, um, home to more than 50% of the planet's biodiversity. But right here in the Big Apple, you know, we also operate the world's largest system of urban zoological parks. We're based out of the Bronx Zoo, but we operate the Bronx Zoo, the Central Park Zoo, the Queen Zoo, the Prospect Park Zoo, and the Aquarium Mode on Coney Island. And yes, they give it up for you if you have your local park there, right? Yes, and see, these parks, they educate 4 million visitors each year about the, uh, the, the value and the importance of conservation. And so tonight, I'm very proud to introduce one of my colleagues who has educated me and so many others about the indigenous landscape of this city of islands that we call home. So um, I'm going to just tell you like one very quick story before I bring him up, but um, my first day at WCS was 19 years ago this, this September. And my supervisor who had hired me at the time said, like, okay, your timing is perfect. 
because your first day, that Monday, we're going to be doing our whole division going out for like a team building outdoor field activity. And so what we were doing is we were going to Central Park with GPS units and we were just kind of recording the coordinates of like any glacial erotica or any of those enormous like rock outcroppings that would have been moved into place around 20,000 years ago. And so little did I know that these efforts would be even very tiny speck in the sea of data that he and his team assembled or like how passionately I would come to feel about everything he does. And I mean, I, I actually brought show and tell because I'm a video person. So it's like, whether it's this beautiful book, Manahara, can we get a round of applause for this one? Yes. Somewhere in there is our, our, our uh, contributions from that Central Park Zoo outing. The, uh, taking it to geographic to be the cover story uh, exactly 400 years after Henry Hudson came up. And, no, 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 last one, the human footprint. He also mapped human influence on planet Earth and was turned into a television special as well. So, literally, Eric, I have always been a fan of your work, so from all those experiences to actually bringing you here today for your very first visit to the Explorers Club, um, without further ado, I'm gonna wait for that cell phone to turn off, and then I'm gonna bring up my friend and colleague, WCS senior conservation ecologist, Dr. Eric Sanderson. Uh, Natalie, needless to say, is one of the most generous people I know as well, so thank you so much for that introduction. And um, thank you all very much uh, for having me here tonight. Um, so I, I like to think I'm an explorer, but I'm more an explorer in time um, than in space. And um, to set that off, I wonder if anybody knows what we're looking at. You can just shout it out. It's not Manhattan. Yeah, so that's, um, um, that's actually Brooklyn Heights, Brooklyn Heights 400 years ago. Yes, congratulations to the lady in the back. Thing. Um, yeah, no, that's Brooklyn Heights that we're looking at, about where the Brooklyn Bridge goes across today. And um, if you look on the left, you can see Wallabout Bay, which is, we know it today as the Navy Yard. Um, and then on the other side, that's Gowanus Creek, as I call it, but Gowanus Canal, the Gowanus Canal neighborhood. Um, and the, the crest of hills in the back, that's, that's the terminal moraine. So that's Prospect Heights and Crown Heights. That's where the Brooklyn Botanical Garden is and the Brooklyn Museum. And, um, and this, this image is one of, of many images that we're creating now to show the historical ecology across all five boroughs of, of New York City, which is um, what I'm gonna talk to you about tonight. Um, so, you know, this, this work started for me um, 24 years ago uh, when I came to New York City to work with Natalie at the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, and I, I had this, I'm an ecosystem and landscape ecologist by training, and I was flying all over the world going to these amazing places that Natalie described, you know, first time to Africa, first time to Asia, first time to Latin America, um, and working with these really amazing people that study the wildlife and landscapes of those places. And they just knew everything about their place, and I was kind of dying for not having a place myself. And um, little did I know that that would become New York City. <laughs> um, to, um, to try and recreate and reimagine what was here, say, 400 years ago, um, when maybe a few hours before Henry Hudson sailed into New York Harbor, the explorer, if you like, that started in motion, what kind of brought us together tonight even. Hey, Alex, could we knock down that light a little bit that's on the screen? Just so you can see a little bit the image, a little bit more. I don't know, maybe they need that for the TV screen. But um, if, you, if you look at this, you can see that you know, the islands was much narrower. It's, Manhattan's about 25% bigger now than it was 400 years ago because of landfill. Um, it was an island that had 54 different ecosystem types, um, which was actually quite startling to me. I'm from California. We're used to like ecological variability. It's kind of what California is known for um, in the ecological space. But, um, but to think that there were 54 ecosystems on Manhattan is quite extraordinary. That's more per acre than you would find in Yellowstone National Park, for example. And it supported an amazing biodiversity. The, there are more bird species um, on Manhattan than you can find in Yosemite National Park, for example, just on this one little narrow island. Um, 
Um, we reconstructed all the plants and animals that lived here, and part of that was also understanding what the people were doing. And these are the Lenape people, who were the indigenous people of New York City um, 400 years ago. And you can see some smoke rising from the collect pond in lower Manhattan to try and give you some indication of, of where they used to live. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is, is the sort of last 24 years of trying to figure out what all of New York City was like, not just Manhattan, what we call the Wilikia Project. Um, and Wilikia is a, another Lenape word um, that we borrowed that means um, my good home. It's what you would, might say to somebody when they come to your wigwam or to your longhouse, you know, welcome, welcome to my good home. And that's what I want people to think of New York City, that this is a place that um, is especially great for human beings, but also for many other kinds of organisms that, to live here. Um, and it's in, in some sense, you know, when we tell the story of New York City, we often forget the natural history part of what made this landscape so wonderful and why such an amazing city grew up here. So there's this um, part that's this kind of map madness where I'll show you how we kind of figure out the process. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about this book that I'm working on now, the sequel to Manahata that um, Natalie showed you. And then just make a few comments about the possibilities that this kind of work opens up, not just for New York City, but I think for cities all over the world. Um, by the way, anybody know where that is? Roosevelt Island, that's right, and that's the East River. So uh, it's, so it's Astoria on the right, and that's Manhattan on the left. Um, so, you know, um, I mentioned I'm a landscape ecologist. Landscape ecologists um, love maps, and they love using modern computation techniques to understand and, and make maps. Um, we're actually in a kind of golden age, if you like, of mapping, although it's mostly in the computer nowadays. Um, but one of the things I've really come to appreciate through this project are historical maps, like this famous chart of New York Harbor from uh, 1844. Ferdinand Rudolf Hassler, in the, in the name there, was the head of the first US Coastal Survey, which was the first scientific agency of the United States government, founded in 1807. And uh, they, were, they were experts in making maps, maps of the coast. And they actually mapped all of the coast and all of the, of the West Coast later in the 19th century. And now they're part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Anyway, so what we do is we take these maps and then we um, geo-reference them to the modern street grids. So what I'm showing you here, the black lines are the street center lines of Brooklyn and, and parts of Queens and a little bit of Manhattan and Staten Island. And then the red things, those are buildings. Those are actually the building footprints. And you can see like here in the Rockaways that there's some buildings that are way out in the water. That's Breezy Point. That's the Breezy Point community that was so destroyed during Hurricane Sandy. In 1844, it was in the water. There was no land there because of course the peninsula, the Rockaway Peninsula has been, has been growing through time. So then from these georeference maps, we digitize features. We digitize the, like the forest blocks and dark green here or the, um, the salt marshes. Um, we digitize the bathymetry, um, so the bathymetric contours or the topographic contours. Um, we look at the shoreline. Shorelines are really interesting, and of course they've been changing through time because of, of climate change and sea level rise. That's not just a 20th, 20th century, 21st century phenomenon. Here, because of the heavy glaciation of this landscape, it's been changing. Oh, it's been changing for the last 20,000 years. Um, and so we make very careful note of when the maps are drawn and then which tide line they're showing, because some maps show the low tide line and some show the high tide line and sh some show the mean tide line. And then we relate that to graphs of, of reconstructions of sea level rise that are made on, based on these uh, formiriferans that live in the salt marshes. Um, and that way we can actually tag that shoreline to what, um, what elevation it should be at. Um, when I was working on Manahata, there was one map, the, British, the famous British headquarters map, that told me kind of 90% of what I needed to know about the landscape features, um, a really wonderful 18th century map. But as we've expanded the work over the rest of the city, um, we've had to use many, many more maps. And actually, this has taken a lot longer than I ever anticipated it would. It took me, me and my colleagues 10 years to reconstruct what Manhattan was like, and it's now 15 years, and we're still, <laughs> still working, sad to say, on the rest of the city. Um, so we take map like Hassler's chart or um, uh, the DRIPS map from 1851 of Queens and Brooklyn um, or the famous Ratzer plan of 1767 or the British headquarters map, there it is. Um, 
or these coastal surveys of Staten Island and so forth and so on. And, you know, as you look at each map, you know, you, they're, they're like texts. You know, you have to read them in the mind of how they were made and why they were made, the technology and the, and the information. You know, you can't make a map that tells you everything about the world, right? You have to make a selection about what's on the map. And so we need to read each of these um, in, the, in the environment that it was made to understand how they fit together so that we can reconstruct the landscape as a whole. Um, so, and then we digitize them. And so I've had many research assistants over the years, and I've done a lot of this myself, you know, digitizing, you know, each point, each line, um, all the bathymetry of the city, um, um, all the streams, and then, you know, trying to make sure the streams line up with the topography. Um, and eventually we build these maps, these um, digital elevation models is one of the fundamental documents, and that's what this is. So this is showing the topography, the and the bathymetry, not just of, you know, sometime in the 19th century, but our reconstruction of what it would have been like 400 years ago, so at the time of Henry Hudson. So the blue colors, these are depths under the water, and the orange and red colors, those are, those are elevations um, above sea level. And then you can see the sort of light blue colors, that's the intertidal zone. So these are areas that are, you know, um, uh, exposed at low tide and covered with water at, at high tide. Um, um, we initially started tr just trying to do New York City and places that were sort of a kilometer or two from the boundary of the city. But, you know, New York City actually has this really weird, funky, triangular shape. So we, um, we've took the, the idea of many, there's famous maps of like 30 miles around New York City, these maps in the round. And so we've added in some of New Jersey and Long Island and, and up into Westchester to just give us a map in the round. So this is picking a, a point sort of at the mouth of Gowanus Creek and drawing a 30 kilometer circle around it. Um, there's so many things to be said about this map. Um, I mean, can you, see, you can see the, the terminal moraine there coming across Long Island and then across Staten Island and then wrapping back around in New Jersey. So this, um, let me see if I can make that work. So this here, yep. So that marks the maximum extent of the last glaciation, the one that, that finished about 20,000 years ago. And it stopped right here in New York City. And so what that implies is everything to the kind of north and west of this line was, was scrubbed down to rock, to bare rock, including where we are right here 20,000 years ago. And, the, and there was 1,000 feet of ice, if you can imagine, <laughs> above us here. <laughs> um, and, uh, and on this side, that, that, it hadn't, that didn't happen. So the coastal plain of here, of, of Queens and Brooklyn and a little bit of Staten Island here, this is over 100,000 years old. And so, you know, the soils on either side of the moraine are quite different from each other, and therefore the vegetation would be quite different from each other, which means the habitats for wildlife would be quite different from each other. Um, something else to be said about the glaciers is when the glaciers were here, there was so much fresh water locked up in the ice, because it wasn't just here, you know, this glacier extended from here all the way to the North Pole, right? And it was ice like that all the way to the North Pole. So there was so much fresh water that the sea level was 100 meters lower. So that means that out here, this was a big valley. And the sea level, the, the shore was sort of out here somewhere, right? So this is, you could have walked from Staten Island across here. Um, you know, the Hudson River coming here was just in a fjord. It was just like a river and then going across this river valley out here like this. Um, this was a, a valley here at Jamaica Bay. Um, yeah, and then, and then, you know, the, the moraine used to go across the narrows here. Um, but as the glaciers started to melt away and to retreat, um, the moraine was still here, and so it created a lake that was back here. And it was, eventually they called it Glacial Lake Albany because it extends up to where Albany was. And it was six meters higher than modern sea level, if you can imagine. A freshwater lake, like a glacial lake, like you would see in... I don't know, Canada or northern Canada or in, in southern Argentina. Um, and the, the, the lake, the outfall was originally over here. And then about um, 16,000 years ago, there was a series of these glacial lakes all the way up into the north. And one of them broke, and there was a dam and a big flood. And this huge body of water came down and broke out the narrows right through here. And you can actually see the scarring and the bathymetry out here. And um, there's one paper that suggests it was so much fresh water that it actually stopped the, the Atlantic circulation um, and the Gulf Stream for a year or two and affected the climate in Europe and in Asia because of this major flood event. Um, 
that, that, that came out here. And eventually the sea level rose and then it filled back in and filled in here and created what Henry Hudson saw 400 years ago. Anyway, there's many, many more stories to be told about this, but in the interest of time, I wanna keep going and we can come back. Um, of course, you know, we live in a, a very kind of aquatic climate. On average, we get four inches of rain or, or snow or precipitation every month all through the year. Again, very different than California where I'm from. Um, and that created streams. And so there were streams all over the city. I don't know if you can tell, but the stream density is actually a little higher here on Staten Island and in the Bronx and on Manhattan than it is here on Long Island. That's because Long Island is basically a big pile of sand that's been created by the series of glaciers. And so most of the water went into the ground, into the groundwater, and then drained out, um, drained out through the subsurface. Um, but the bedrock is much closer to the surface in, um, in these other parts of the city, which created the streams. Um, these streams, by the way, have been coming back as we've had you know, more and more severe rain events like Hurricane Ida. You know, when you know, people were dying, you know, people died in their basements. It was this terrible tragedy. Um, and then afterwards, I was you know, listening to the news and looking at my maps, and it turns out all those places, there was a wetland there, or there was a pond, or there was a stream. Um, yeah. So, and now I'm working with the city to help try and identify places where the city is going to have to adapt to climate change because it used to be a stream or a wetland and because it's still flooding and where it's predicted to flood um, into the future. Um, also, the springs. The, there's this famous book about the springs in New York City, so we've reconstructed those. The wetlands, of course. Um, you know, we're a coastal environment, so there used to be these massive tidal marshes um, all fringing the city all around the city. Um, and then, of course, we've done a lot of work on the Lenape because human beings are such an important way to shape the landscape. And so using historical evidence and archaeological surveys and, um, and trying to pull all the information together. Um, and it's over 550 sites that um, we have on the map now. And I'm sure this is just a subset of all the possible sites. And these aren't just Lenape sites. Some of them are much older. There's sites that are in, in the New York City region that are five and six and 8,000 years old. Um, there's a site uh, out here in the Bronx. Um, oops, sorry. Let me go back. There's a site out here, Ware Creek, um, in the Bronx. I was talking to somebody from Country Club earlier um, that's 6,000 years old, and there's elk bones in the bottom um, when they excavated it, um, and sturgeon that were, were fished out of the local waters back then. Um, so we take all this information and we build all kinds of databases to sort of support the efforts. And because it's taken so long, this is a really important way of trying to main co maintain continuity. So we map these spatial data resources, which are mostly maps, but also include texts. Um, and then we keep track of who's who, you know, who found it, who got the highest resolution version of it, and then georeferenced it, and then eventually digitized it. Um, I've taught at NYU and at Columbia, and I've had many students over the years who've helped me with this work. Um, and then we, we also keep very careful track of the bibliographic information. We use this um, free software, it's really great, called Zotero. If you actually Google Zotero and Wailikia, you'll you can see our reference list, um, which is in the, it's over 10,000 entries at this point. Um, we also really pay a lot of attention to place names. Um, and this has been more important in the Wailikia work than the original Manahata work. Um, and so, you know, what's great about a place name is you can see a name on a map, and then once you have the name, you can search text. Um, kind of scientifically accurate maps sort of in this region date from the late 18th century through the 19th century. But if you want a 17th century description, of which there are very many in the text, well, you need a name. And then it turns out, of course, that New York City's streams and hills, have, you know, some of them have Lenape names that we've been able to find, that are, many are documented in the old deeds and um, agreements, agreements and quotes that were signed between the Dutch and the Lenape that are the basis of all of our property rights here in New York City. Um, there's Dutch names, of course, and then sometimes we have American names, you know, British names, English names, and then British or American names. And sometimes there's multiple names. You can be 10 names or 20 names for some of the features. Um, and so we catalog all that through these, through these databases. And, and then you actually extract direct quotes out of all the sources um, and then put them in these databases so that as I'm writing the atlas, I can read these and then sort of reconstruct what, what the feature was, its ecology, and then what happened to it. Um, and then, you know, we put these things back together. You take the text and the maps, and then you can, you know, create this map. This is uh, the Bronx River, um, and then all the streams in the South Bronx um, that were once there. 
Um, we also use imagery, so you know, paintings. Anybody know where this is? So it's a little closer to home. So yeah, that's the Palisades on the left for sure, which implies what's on the right. That's right. So this is the beach at 100. That's at 125th Street, or was it 125th Street? Um, and that's uh, Washington Heights here. And this is Jeffrey's Hook. This is where the George Washington Bridge goes across, because that's the narrowest point across the Hudson River. And this painting is 1843 by Victor Gifford Audubon, who is John James Audubon's son. And that's uh, John James sitting on the rock, watching the men bring in fish. And I've been told by people that know their fish that um, this painting is about actually a little bit larger than this. It's in the Museum of the City of New York. And you can identify these fish to species. And that wasn't really so long ago, 1843. Um, to think that that's what it was like. So we use images like this. You know, if you look at our Manahata reconstructions, you'll see like these these rocks are in the appropriate place, including the rock he's sitting on. Um, we also, you know, can use photography, 19th century or early 20th century photography, particularly in you know some of the outer boroughs. Uh, this is the famous um, a rocking stone at the Bronx Zoo. Uh, which was a major, used to be a major tourist attraction. It's, it's uh, cemented in place, I'm sorry to say. But it used to be that, that um, you could go up and you could just move it with one hand. And yet, um, when they were building the zoo, they wanted to remove it. And it took, they took like, I don't know, all these oxen. And they couldn't move it with the oxen because it was so heavy. And you know, this, this object is a glacial erratic. Right, so this is something that the glacier, when it was retreating, you know, dropped this rock, and it's been there for 20,000 years. And you can still go and see it, although you have to know kind of where to look. Um, this Jackson Mill Creek, this is under LaGuardia Airport today. And um, that's Glover's Rock, which was important during the Battle of Pelham, in, uh, and it's in Pelham Bay Park, which you can go and visit today. Uh, so um, then we take all this information, all this geographic information, and where the Native Americans were, um, and then we reconstruct the relationships, the ecological relationships between all the elements. So the idea is to figure out a way to be able to map all the plants and animals that used to live here. Um, and so we build these databases that specify all the relationships between, between the species and between the species and the abiotic parts of the environment. Um, and then that allows us to build these sort of network diagrams that then we use to model the species distribution. And, and this, you know, this originally was just sort of an intermediate product of the research effort, but um, it's really come to mean a lot to me. Um, it's, this, this is showing all the relationships between all the plants and animals that used to live on Manhattan. Um, so this, these are the terrestrial plants and animals, and these are the freshwater ones and ones living in streams or in ponds or in wetlands and then these are the marine the marine one and you can see all these little gray lines each one of these is a specific relationship between something in the environment and something else in the environment and if you zoom in it looks like this i mean really dense levels of interconnection which is actually what makes nature resilient and strong and, and it's you know it's what natalie and i are trying to work to conserve at the wildlife conservation society is all these connections and um and one of these connections is people one of these dots out here is the lenape people and it has a lot of connections back to everything else but but what's important to say about it is of course it depends on the connections to everything else as well right it's not in the driver's seat it's actually part of the uh, the part of the fabric of life here. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, we're used to the idea of a social network, right, you know, especially here in the 21st century, and the idea that we all depend on each other, you know, and, and that that's a really important part of what resilience means. Um, but I think sometimes human beings, because we're so social, we get so focused on our own network of relationships that we forget that there's this much larger and denser network of relationships that actually allows us to be here. Um, and that's what the mirror webs are trying to show. So then we take this, all this information, and then we, you know, you can pick any part of the city. In this case, uh, that's uh, Newtown Creek and uh, Williamsburg and the Bushwick Inlet there. Um, and uh, that's the Navy Yard and Wallabout Bay. And then um, we understand what the bedrock is underlying that area. And then the surficial geology. So this is what was left by the glaciers, uh, stratified drift and till sand and dust and then from that we can map the soil types we've mapped over 80 different indigenous soil types in new york city um, and then the topography as we've talked about 
and then the wetlands and the streams within that topography, and then yeah, the wetlands. And then um, the ecological community map has over 200 different communities, so, you, so I, I'm actually struggling to even know how to color this map. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, but I can just show you some of the individual communities, the low salt marsh or the maritime oak forest or uh, the coastal oak hickory forest. This is where American chestnuts used to live. You know, American chestnuts were the most important tree in the forests of this part of the world for thousands of years. Um, and they don't persist anymore because of the chestnut blight, but this is where they would have lived. Um, but not just the communities, but also individual species. The clustered flower bluet, anybody? Um, this is a quote from John Torrey, who is a, an important early American botanist, grew up here in Manhattan, and wrote his first book about the flora within 30 miles of, of New York City. And he wrote this little quote about finding uh, this, this species um, on the borders of a swamp near Brooklyn. Or uh, smooth cordgrass, which is the, you can still see this, this is the salt marsh specialist. Or the Eskimo curlew, which used to be in you know amazing abundance here. It's a coastal seabird that was um, blown out by the market hunting of the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, formerly observed in mermations, seen occasionally in the hundreds in fields on Long Island, known as the foot on Long Island or the doe bird in New England. Last one killed at Montauk in 1891. Um, but fortunately, because of conservation, you can still see samples of these ecosystems, and to the extent they exist, the wildlife is still trying to use them. Um, you know, coastal oak hickory forest, this is um, actually at the New York Botanical Garden in the Bronx, or um, low and high salt marshes, this is uh, near Rye Playland in, um, in Westchester. Or, uh, or we can reconstruct the view. Anybody have an idea where this view is? This one's a little harder. So this is what Mickey Mantle would have seen from center field in Yankee Stadium if he'd gone back a few hundred years. <laughs> so this is the view from Yankee Stadium looking toward home plate. Um, so this is the, the Menta Path or Cromwell's Creek coming down through a, a salt marsh system. We have some elk here um, on the verge of the forest. And actually, this is. Um, Washington Heights, this is like Coogan's Bluff across the way for those of you that know their baseball history. So just uh, some numbers, um, just to give you an idea. 500, I can't even tell you how many maps exactly we've consulted because it's so many over the years. 300 maps georeferenced, tens of thousands of features digitized. Um, this, this I have a little bit more of a handle because I'm, I'm writing about these places in my book. Um, 3,844 places with names, of which there's 7,947 names, um, and over 10,000 descriptions in the database, and 800 some documents or maps referenced so far. Um, and the geography, you know, trying to reconstruct the geography of the past of 400 years ago 500 miles of streams, 470 miles of shoreline, 1,250 ponds. 525 springs, 2,600 acres of freshwater wetlands, 3,100 acres of tidal wetlands, 550 Lenape sites, of which I, of which that's just a, like I say, a subset because there's many, many that I'm sure still lie under the city. That, that, you know, every year we find new archaeological sites in the city um, when development happens. 350 miles of Lenape trails. Uh, the Muir Web has 2,488 elements as of uh, about four o'clock this afternoon, um, 9,977 relationships. And then, you know, we have this modeling algorithms that we've written that take about 125 inputs and then generate over 2,000 outputs. Um, so maps that are georeferenced to the city at 10 meter resolution, so 10 meters cells. So, um, which means there'll be many, you know, just under this building that then characterize the probability of different plants and animals living there 400 years ago. So 24 years and counting, you see the white beard. Um, you know, 90 plus research assistants and, and I feel like I've talked to anybody who knows anything about nature in New York City at one point or another. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm, I, um, a couple years ago, right before the pandemic, I had a fellowship at the library, um, a Coleman fellowship, and I was sitting in my, in the, my office at the, li at the New York Public Library at 42nd Street, trying to think, how am I ever gonna write anything about this? How am I gonna like pull it all together? Because it was just so much. 
Um, and what I came out of that is this idea of a Wielikia atlas. So Wielikia again is this word that is sort of um, a borrowed word meant to represent our relationship to the city. Um, and just a couple of comments. I actually put this part of the presentation together to talk to my Coleman fellows about who are all like novelists and playwrights and poets, and they're like, well, I don't exactly understand what you're doing, but, but we're really interested. Um, and, and one thing I knew is I, couldn't, I just couldn't write Manahata again. If, I don't know how many people have read it, but it's sort of, you know, it's sort of this, this crazy guy comes to New York, doesn't know what he's doing, he finds this old map, he stands on rocks with Natalie in Central Park, um, you know, he figures out what the plants and animals were, learns lots of interesting things, and then, and then the last part of the book is trying to imagine what Manhattan 400 years from now might look like if we built it, you know, with some knowledge, some idea about the historical ecology. Um, but I just knew I couldn't write this book again, because, like, how could you do, you know, you can't tell the same story over again in the Bronx, like it just like it just wouldn't make sense. And then what about Brooklyn or Staten Island? You know, it just wasn't going to work. So, um, so instead, what I decided to do is an atlas and a gazetteer, and I'll show you some of the ideas, some of the maps there. Another thing about Manahata is um, is that I worked with this really uh, great man named Markley Boyer to make these images, and uh, everybody remembers the images from Manahata. Um, everybody does. So much so that I, I have people that I've known, you know, and I, I treasure who still say to me, you know, Eric, I was like thumbing through Manahata one day and, and I was looking at the pictures and they're so great. And then I, I actually started reading and it was so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to say from an author's perspective, that's not really what you want to hear. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so yeah, so, so I wanted to fix that. Another thing is that the maps in Manahata are really small. Um, if you actually try and read them and use them, they're really difficult because of the like limits of the physical size of the book. So you know, an atlas, as big an atlas as as I can get away with. Um, yeah, the maps are just too damn small. Um, that's actually a direct quote from a friend of mine. Um, so and then you know we we built this cool website that allows you to zoom to any block in Manhattan, get a list of all the plants and animals that used to live there. You know, like this, like that. Um, gets used all the time, but you know, and this is a really great way to give you like this really detailed data summary. What was that? Oh, is that your house? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you know there used to be meadow voles living in your house? Um, yeah, or before your house, I guess I should say. So, but you know, you have to figure out like how how is a book and a website? How are those things going to relate to each other? Um, just checking the time. Natalie, you'll let me know if I'm going on too long, right? So we've um, created these, these plates. They're going to be 1 to 24,000 plates, which is the same as like a USGS topographic map. And um, I'll show you a couple examples of these. And we're, we're basically trying to make like these, you know, landscape maps using the USGS topographic style, but of New York City 400 years ago. Does that make sense? Um, and so, and to, and to give the, the names of all the features as we have them, um, in, including trying to prioritize the Lenape names, the indigenous names where we have them. Um, and, you know, even this is a hard, it's kind of fraught to know how to spell these things because, of course, the Lenape didn't have a written language and the, and the way we get these names is mostly the, a Dutch or an English person writes them down and, you know, they might not have written them down right. So... I've been working with some linguists to try and get this as close as possible, but you can't really say for sure. Um, and then for each of these names to be writing the story of the places behind them. Um, and, you know, doing some, some pairs in opposition with each other. You know, some reconstructions, but also the modern, the modern city. Um, and then writing the histories of these things. So this is my this is my way out of, you know, if I can't tell just like one story, well, why don't you just tell I don't know 3,500 stories instead, right? Um, so some of these are longer stories like Oakland Lake. I don't know if you know Oakland Lake out in Queens and Alley Pond Park, a really beautiful lake still persists, created by the glaciers 20,000 years ago. Um, had many many Lenape sites right around it. Um, but then, of course, it has uh, a history that follows that. So telling more of the history of, you know, also telling the history of the 17th century and the 19th century and then the 20th century, including a lot of these features have been destroyed. So why were they destroyed and who destroyed them? Um, and, then, and then also, because it's just been so much work to give the quote, to give the text, 
to give these the references so that nobody, you know, I'm not saying I know everything about Oakland Lake, but I am saying you should look at these things first before you do anything about Oakland Lake. Um, like, and I'm going to give you the page numbers, so you have no, you know, you just have no excuse. And then, you know, the maps associated with them. Um, and then, you know, to illustrate that with some reconstructions, but also with, you know, excerpts of the maps or modern photography. Um, you know, some of the entries are going to be a lot shorter because, you know, I can't write a thousand words about every feature because, you know, the book's going to be a really long book, right? Um, so some of them are shorter, but still, still important. And, uh, and there are just so many names. And frankly, many of them have been f completely forgotten, you know, um, in, here in the 21st century. Um, and, I, and, I, and I have to say that one of the things I've come to appreciate is how if you, for all generations of New Yorkers, until you get caught of the mid 20th century, this is the way they thought of the city. They thought of the streams and the wetlands and the ponds. I mean, it was a really important way of having a relationship to it, and that really comes through as you, as you read these texts. Um, so the Lenape had a certain relationship, the people before the Lenape had a certain relationship, and the people after had a relationship. And that's because human beings make connections to nature. We just can't help it. You know, our social networks are not just other human beings. They do actually include nature and streams and hills and swamps and so forth. And every one of these is like a, I don't know, it's like a little breadcrumb on an exploration, if you like, into the past and into these, these features. Um, and so in this way, we take these, you know, these reconstructed images that are based on all this research over time. And, um, and like this is, this is the Cluck Pond in lower Manhattan and the smoke from the Lenape settlement here. And these are fields that were cut out of the forest uh, by the Lenape and salt marshes and seven kinds of forests and the beaches along the Hudson River. Um, and this same place looks like this. And it is, it is completely extraordinary that it happened like that. And that, that's, this is also what we have. Um, and you know, what I'm really trying to do is give us all a way to help us think not just about the past, but to explore our way into the future, a, a future where you know, the New York City that I love will persist um, in a way that will last you know, beyond our lifetimes or beyond you know, a few hundred years. Right? I mean, this, this landscape lasted for thousands and thousands of years, and in such a way that all these plants and animals and people too were able to survive and persist and get what they needed out of the landscape, all just right here. Um, in a way, I don't see that resilience in this side of the, of the image. Um, and I'm really interested in, in helping us all think about how we can imagine that together and imagine a process where we can actually make it happen. Um, because, you know, underneath the maps and underneath the ideas are ideas that we inherited from the 17th century, from people like Henry Hudson, you know. Like, Hudson didn't care at all about New York, right? He, like, he was trying to get to China. That was, like, his whole thing. <laughs> um, and so, you know, he, he came, you know, he was a very good navigator, and he found his way through the Narrows and to New York Bay, and then he saw the Hudson River, and he thought, well, that's it. You know, that's the fjord that'll take me to China. And he was so disappointed when he got up to Albany and the river shallowed out. Um, but then, you know, he just left and never came back again, and he, he ended up dying in Hudson Bay on the same quest, you know, trying to get to, to China. He, like, he completely missed what was so important, so, so important. Um, right before his eyes. Or, or this guy, do, does anybody know who this is? So that's who our city's named after. That's uh, James, Duke of York, and that's why it's New York. And this guy, in um, 1664, his, his brother, who happened to be King Charles II of England, not three, that's the one we have now, so he, second of Charles, he gave his brother a letter, and he says, I give you all the, all the land between the Delaware River and the Connecticut River and New England and Maine. Just go take it. And he sailed a gunship uh, across the Atlantic and into New York Harbor and, and said to Peter Stuyvesant, you're out. And he said, okay. And that was it. That was it. So, you know, think of that. Like everything about us speaking English, you know, all of our sort of English culture, you know, I mean, uh, as I was talking to Alex before, you know, he's showing me all the European collections of, of objects that are in this building. It all goes back to this guy. And, you know, this guy, 
you know, he never came here. He never wanted him here. He gave New Jersey to settle a bet. Like he, like he is not interested at all in this place except in terms of the money it can make him and the wealth that it could give him. He had no, he did not care about the landscape at all or the people that were here or the wildlife at all. Um, our sense of law and property and, and even some sense of justice all inherits from these dudes. And they had, they had, you know, they were, their ideas were 400 years old. It's 400 years later now. We need to be revisiting some of these things. Um, you know, to imagine all the, all the New Yorkers that are here. Um, I love this poster campaign that the Park Serviston did. Um, um, and in such a way that allows the skeptical, the intrepid, the creative, and the tree to create the future of New York City that lasts. Thank you very much. Okay, well, we have questions pouring in like online. We've got questions in the room, but another round of applause for Eric, please. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are people that are tuned in with you all from across the United States, from Spain, from Portugal, from Scotland, um, all really excited. I am actually going to take this opportunity to throw you the first question okay. um, because, you know, these maps are just amazing. The Explorers Club has 5,000 maps in the map room upstairs and just like to fill in those white spots that were there at one point, you know, and now, you know, there's new tools. And I wanted to ask you, like, over the time that you've been doing that, how have the tools changed? And even with AI to, like, you know, break down the, the mirror webs. And actually, you should probably tell them, for people who didn't read the book, what, why you call those the mirror webs. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, yes, this whole technology that I'm talking about now has been growing and expanding so fast. You just you can't even imagine when I when I was in grad well, when my major professor was teaching me these techniques, she had to study them at JPL in and use mainframe computers bigger than this room, right, to do the kinds of things we're doing. Um, I used all these like fancy workstations that were very difficult to use in graduate school. Um, when I came to WCS, we started doing things on laptop, and now your phone can do calculations that used to take you know supercomputers to do, um, and we just do it without even thinking on Google Maps. And um, yeah, AI is a big part of that. There's a thing called the Google Earth Engine that we I have a whole bunch of other projects using, which is like this massive GIS in the sky that's collecting all the satellite data that's falling, you know, terabytes of data and Put it into the computer, you write line, one line of code, you can get a Landsat image from this date, from this place. It's just the most extraordinary thing. Um, so yeah, so computer, you know, com and computers are what enabled this, all this to happen, to do these kind of calculations that you, you know, that if you're just going to do by hand. So, I mean, I'm so excited to see what the future holds in that respect, yeah. yeah. So, and I'll just say Muir webs are named after John Muir, the California naturalist. John Muir has this quote about, um, I won't get it exactly, but it, you know, he's sitting on a rock. He thinks, you know, that everything, everything in the universe is connected to everything else, and that's kind of what mirror webs are trying to show us: is how everything is connected. Um, so. Okay, so for fairness, I will do um, a question in the room, then run out. I think I have six questions online, and then we'll just stick in the room. Okay, okay. so first question in the room. Uh, I saw your hand to go up first, uh, right there with the dark hair. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, wait, hang on. I need, think I need to be running mics as well. Yeah. Do we have an idea what percentage of animals and plants were lost in the last 400 years? From New York City specifically? Yeah, in, in New York City. Yeah, right? well, it's, it's interesting. Um, so it depends on which taxa you're talking about. So it depends. So in terms of, I don't know, say in terms of birds, we know of three species that have gone globally extinct that were here. The um, Eskimo curlew, um, the um, passenger pigeon, of course, and... Um, and, and the, there was this, um, nah, and the name is exciting me, but there was this duck, I mean, not this duck, this kind of prairie chicken that used to live on the grasslands around here. Oh. But otherwise, you can still see 350 species of birds, you know, if you know what to do. And many of them, you can go to Central Park and see them, right? Um, so, so that's true. In terms of mammals, I don't think there's anything that's, that, that was here that's globally extinct, but there's many things that aren't here at all anymore. Black bears, wolves, um, 
you know, but like, you know, for a long time, people thought whales and porpoises weren't around, but now they're coming back because the, the harbor's clear. Did you, did you see the video of the porpoises in, or the dolphins in the Bronx River uh, last week? I mean, truly extraordinary. There was a beaver when in 2007. Um, some of our colleagues were taking a walk and they, <laughs> and they came to me and they said, Eric, I think we saw a beaver on the Bronx River. And I said, no. Yeah. No, you know, there haven't been beavers on the Bronx River for 200 years. I'm sure you saw a muskrat. And they're like, no, no, Eric, I'm pretty sure it was a beaver. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happened when you work at a zoo. So then I went out with them, and sure enough, it was a beaver. It was a beaver. And a beaver, the closest beaver population is up in, in northern Putnam County. And so that beaver somehow got in the Bronx River, moved all the way down through Scarsdale, through Bronxville, and... <laughs> Decided to want to live in the Bronx, in the Bronx Zoo, why in the wild? Um, yeah, and so um, one of our colleagues um, suggested that, given that Jose Serrano, the congressman, had given so much money to help fix up the Bronx River, that we should name this beaver after him. So it was Jose the Beaver. <laughs> it's quite the thing. Um, and then a couple years later, another beaver showed up. And um, so the Bronx River Alliance, which is a local conservation group, they decided they would ask the kids in the neighborhood what they should call it, and they came up with Justin. <laughs> Justin Beaver. Justin yes. Beaver. <laughs> yeah. Needless to say, my friends at the New York Botanical Garden were not so keen about the <laughs> idea of a beaver on the Bronx River. Started, like, wrapping their trees in aluminum foil. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, in terms of plants, there's a bunch of plants that were here that we don't, we can't find anymore. There are a bunch of kind of rare plants, but those things presumably could be back, come back. Um, yeah, um, the reptile herp fauna, a lot of that's gone, but some of it's still here. Like um, timber rattlesnake. Did you know timber rattlesnake was first described? The type specimen is from in the vicinity of New York City. So rattlesnake creek in the Bronx, if you know. So, so yeah. Excellent. Um, I think the question is what we can have more of in the future, because I think we could have all these things, all the things except for the big dangerous ones back. And the big dangerous ones, I think the city owes something to conserve them. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, we got Ann Passer manning the, uh, the Facebook and the uh, YouTube channel. So Tim Keyes is asking, are New York City building permits informed by this excellent work, such as, you know, to better manage flooding risk or habitat loss? No, not yet. Um, but I am working with the DEP as I said, on a climate adaptation study that involves this kind of work. Um, and we've been talking about, I don't, know if, I don't know if we'll find the funding to this, but you know, we could write a letter to every property owner in New York City and say, hey, property owner at whatever street, you know, what, what's the address here? 46? We're at 46 East 70th. Yeah. Hey, Explorers Club, did you know that you used to have, you know, four pages of these species? And it used to be this kind of ecosystem. And by the way, you're, on, you know, you're 100 meters from the nearest stream, so maybe you should watch out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or the people that live in the ocean, right? Like, oh, here are all the fish that live where you're living now. Okay. And returning to the room, because um, I, I tell you you're right at the same time, and then, uh, okay. yes, yes, yes. Because like, you went up the same time. Yeah. Okay, I'll speak loud so you don't have to run over me. No, actually, I, just for the recording, I'm sorry about that. Oh. Okay, my question is regarding Egbert Vili, yeah, who wrote sure. a water map in 1865. I wondered yeah. how you are supplementing with your work, his work, and how that helps contractors and others here in the city. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Yeah, does, do people know the famous Vili water map of 1865, which is, is an early version of what we're trying to do, except that Vili was working in 1865, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, Vili, he's an interesting guy. He, he was a soldier. He was in the Mexican-American War, and when he was in Mexico, he observed, or thought he observed anyway, that dams, streams, and impoundments led to disease, like yellow fever and cholera, which is kind of sort of the way it works, not exactly, but that's kind of sort of the way it works. And so he became the chief engineer of New York City, and he did just what I was trying to do, but in the 19th century, to map the streams of Manhattan and created this famous water map, which inevitably, if there's a water main or a leak or somebody discovers water in New York City, and then they write it up in the New York Times, they'll talk about how the contractor went to the New York Public Library and went to the map room and looked at the Vili water map, and yes or no, there was a stream there. Um, so Vili didn't have um, the British headquarters map from 1782, 
Um, so that's he mostly worked for Randall's farm maps from the uh, from like 1812 to 1823, and then some other stuff. Um, I also think his georeferencing wasn't perfect, at least compared to our maps. So so we have some more streams. I'd like to think they're better map, but you know I'm willing to concede. And of course now we have all five boroughs in New York City. Yeah, really just in Manhattan. Awesome uh, online, Jenny. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> No, no, that, that was New York City back then because, you know, Brooklyn and Queens, the Bronx were all separate. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. But it does still irk me a little bit when people are like, oh, yeah, do you know about the Veely water map? And I'm like, yeah, I do know about the Veely water map. Yeah. Do you know about the streams from Sanderson at all that you can download? <laughs> yeah. Do you know Spring Street was a spring? Yes. Um, okay, so Jenny Wilk, we ask online, what kinds of fossils were discovered in New York City from your research, and did the dinosaurs keep away from the area? No, no. Um, so, so those are two, two slightly different questions. But yeah, so in the, if you go to the end of the Cretaceous, um, this is the book that's gonna, that I'm going to write after this book's done. Um, <laughs> I'm going, to write a, <laughs> I'm going to write a book that's called Before New York that starts the day before Henry Hudson got here and then goes back in time all the way to the Big Bang. So stay tuned for that. But anyway, um, in the Cretaceous, you know, sea level was much, much higher than Eve was in the glaciers. It was, it was 300 meters of water of higher sea level. And so all of this was underwater. So there would have been like plyliosaurs swimming around above us. And um, there haven't been fossils found here, but there are a lot of fossils in um, northern New Jersey, um, so just off the map that way, um, from that period, from the Cretaceous period. Um, in terms of more recent fossils, though, there's been a number of mastodon fossils found. I was, you know, looking at those, yes. those tusks over there, which I don't think are from New York City, but... Um, Four tusked elephant right here. Yeah, there you go. Um, but there, yeah, the number of mastodons, also some Pleistocene horses uh, remains have been found in New York City. Um, so, yeah. Cool. I want to get one on this side. Oh, okay, well, you got it first. I'm going to bring you, actually, I keep thinking there's two microphones. <laughs> so, uh, the Meadowlands in New Jersey, are those, like, still what they look like 400 years ago, or are those new? Are they new? Well, well. How like preserved have they been since? Like, they're not well preserved. They're, they're not well preserved. Yeah, they're all they're all messed up. But yeah, there used to be massive, massive um, salt marshes, and then, and then um, there's some early indications from the 17th century that some of that was forested with Hellenic cedar. So these like um, freshwater intertidal swamps. Like there's records of like pirates going up into the Hackensack Meadows and hiding out there under under trees. Um, and that area, you know, that's. The, the Palisades um, is volcanic activity from about 30 million years ago. And that same volcanic activity created the mountain range on the other side of the Hackensack Meadows. And then it dropped down in the Newark Basin. And that's why it's lower in there and why it's below, below sea level. Um, but yeah. And those things, they're, they're actually, they're very well mapped. And they were, they were pretty much you know, untouched until, until the kind of late uh, 19th century. And then and a lot of them had been filled in. And then a lot of industrial activity. You know, it in the, it's in the late 19th century that New York City, um, you know, industrialized. And a lot of the upland areas already had people living in them. And so a lot of the industry went into the marshes. And that's not tr just not, not just true in New Jersey, but also in, in New York. Like Newtown Creek, for example. You know, Newtown Creek used to be where people used to go on vacation. Um, but then we set up all these oil refineries, or Gowanus, the same thing. And, and, you know, the 19th century practice was... If you have a waste, you just dump it in the nearest water body, which was you know, right next to you, like Newtown Creek or Gowanus, Gowanus Creek or Gowanus, Gowanus Canal or, or the Passaic River, for that matter, or the Hackensack River. And so they're terribly polluted. And, and we're living with that legacy because some of those chemicals last for thousands of years. Um, and it's, you know, and you think about it, like it was such a very short period of time, a very short sightedness. And it's this kind of like, um, I don't know, blindness to what you're doing. I mean, how could anybody think that that was a reasonable thing to do or that you could just dump all your waste into the water and it would be taken care of somehow? It just, it's like a magical, nutty thinking. Um, and yet, you know, we're going to be living with that and our kids are going to be living with that for a long time. And we have John Coaches asking, how have northern dams and reservoirs like the Kensico Reservoir or the Croton Dam changed the southern wetlands and biodiversity of Manhattan? Well, I don't know that they have, except that maybe in some cases they've created them. 
you know, there was, in, in terms of the New York City context, of course, to, to deliver the water from the, the water system, they had to build the, the aqueduct. Um, and so that caused a lot of changes. Um, and, and even down here into Central Park, like the original receiving reservoir for the Croton water system um, in Central Park isn't the reservoir that we know today. It was actually a reservoir that was just to the south of it where the Great Lawn is. Um, and it was actually, it was called Lake Manahata, just, just <laughs> FYI. Um, and, and that's why when you go to the Great Lawn, you don't see any rocks, right? There's no big like, rock outcrops there because they were all blown up because there was a reservoir there. And then, of course, that reservoir, you know, led down to the reservoir at um, 42nd Street. And that, you know, that existed in, until the late 19th century. And then when they didn't need that reservoir anymore, that's what created the land, which is where the New York Public Library is in Bryant Park, right? So that's where those things came from. And then there was another reservoir down at, at Union Square, once upon a time, that then fed lower Manhattan. So all these things, all these features about the water system, you know, they are still like, you know, if you read the landscape, you can still see that history here. And of course, all of that was even necessary because, because they, <laughs> because there, you know, there was a pond, there was a collect pond in lower Manhattan. It was 80 feet deep, fed by underwater springs. The Lenape lived there for thousands of years. Europeans lived there. That was where, you know, all the Dutch got their water from and the British and during the American Revolution. And then right after the American Revolution, they let a leather tannery set up shop and it dumped all its waste into the collect pond, <laughs> which was the fresh water source for the city. And like, oh no, we don't have any water anymore that we just poisoned our water supply. So let's build this water system to bring water 30 miles from the north down <laughs> to the city. I mean, it's just like... Really, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? No, I just think of all the changes even in our lifetime with like the Audubon report showing that how many songbirds we lost in North America just in you know our lifetime of right. 50 years to lose that many. Or at the zoo, we used to every this time, you know, we would have snow up to the, the, the rail around the sea yeah. lion pool. Right. And now maybe we get like one massive blizzard a year and then the rest is like this. Like these changes, they happen very, very it's, quickly. It's, it's an interesting question to ask like what people 100 years from now will think about our behavior today. Oh, that hand went up quickly. Oh, hang on, I'm coming to you over here. Yeah, Eric, great talk. I enjoy hearing it every time. Thanks, Daniel. Um, have you seen the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, proposal resiliency plan for all of New York City uh, projected with the different projections of sea level rise, climate change, and yeah. so forth? and the uh, various proposals for what they call resiliency um, barriers. Um, can you speak to the impacts that, have, have you seen that report in I have seen any that kind report. of detail? Yeah, yeah. Okay, can you speak to some of the impacts on some of the remaining bits of natural shoreline that we have left? such as uh, Flushing Creek, for example. There's little tiny pockets, Newtown Creek, um, maybe, I don't know about Gowanus, but um, uh, maybe Inwood, uh, that marsh up there. I didn't see specifically what yeah. the plan was up there, but can you speak to some of the impacts of that uh, plan? Thank you. Sure, sure. So um, what Daniel's referring to is the, the latest the latest iteration of the Army Corps suggestions about how they might pour a lot of concrete to save us from climate change. Um, um, and that's a combination of seawalls and barriers, um, and in some cases floodgates that, would, that they would close only when like a storm surge was coming. So all this stuff, this is only about coastal storm surge, right? It's not gonna help you with a Hurricane Ida type event where you have a lot of inland rain and actually may, might, might make that a lot worse. Um, well, I think you know New York City faces some really hard challenges. I mean, my preference would be to use nature-based solutions wherever it's appropriate, um, because A, they're cheaper, B, they're more resilient, and C, they're gonna adapt with the climate change. Um, the problem with these, like, these barriers is you gotta build the wall so high, and what if you don't build it quite high enough? Well, now you've created a bathtub, not a barrier, right? Um, the other thing is they reflect, you know, so you build a barrier here, well, that water's still there, it's just gonna go somewhere else, right? So the person or the community that doesn't have a barrier, they're the ones who are gonna, you know, get, get affected by it. Um, uh, the problem is, is there's, you know, so much money that they're talking about, and there's many jobs that come with that um, in a way that, you know, salt marshes don't provide the same job, sadly. Um, so, but I, I think the sort of bigger point is that um, there's no way 
that the mistakes that we made in the 20th century are things that we can replicate forever into the 21st century, given sea level rise and storm surge and climate change in general. And this isn't just a New York City problem, it's a city for all, a problem for all coastal cities. And, and other, other iterations of natural processes are modified by the climate. And we're just gonna have to move. There's some people that are just gonna have to move. Um, you know, in the near term, they might be forced to move, and in the long term, well, I just think there'll be less pain if we just decide that there's some places we can't live anymore. And I know that's hard because, you know, because housing is not affordable in New York City, and, um, and that's all about the land base. So uh, this is really going to force a lot of changes in the city, and there's going to be a, you know, it's New York City, right? So we're going to argue about what those changes should be and how they should be done. Um, but I think it's really important for everybody in this room to be involved in that conversation. Um, and to bring nature's perspective into the conversation, not just um, the engineering perspective that we can design our way out of any, any problem. And Daniel was there for when we had the beaver return, because he was there at the Botanical Garden. So <laughs> we Probably did not share. a beaver fan, but we yeah. won't mention that. <laughs> <laughs> um, last question I think I have online is, oops, if I can get it to turn. Also from Jenny, could you provide some history behind the gridiron pattern of the street system in New York City? Did this planning happen under Dutch occupation? Yes, ju just briefly, um, the, the, the kind of standard grid that we have was adopted in 1811 by these three commissioners, the, commis the famous commissioner's plan, which you can go to the map room at the public library and see. And uh, they did this uh, <laughs> it's kind of crazy thing. They're like, well, let's just plan it all out now. So, you know, starting at 1st Street all the way up to 155th Street and then eventually further north from there in Manhattan, they created a, a grid. And then they hired this guy, John Randall Jr., who I mentioned earlier, to survey in the grid. And yeah, that was a really hard job. You know, so he's like, he's, his job was to go and play mar place marble markers at the street intersections for the avenues and major streets. And so he'd be like, you know, okay, here is where... 42nd Street and 5th Avenue are going to meet someday. But it wasn't, back then there was no street. It was just somebody's field. So imagine, you know, you're a farmer on Manhattan and this guy shows up and says, oh no, we're going to put a street right here. And I'm going to mark this boulder because we're going to blow that one up. And then this stream, we're going to fill that in. Um, you know, he got arrested several times. People chased him off their land. I mean, you know, imagine if you went to, I don't know, pick, pick wherever you want. Western Pennsylvania and started doing this. Like, you know, <laughs> would not go over well, right? Um, and even there was a newspaper article that said, you know, you're planning for a population the size of China to live on Manhattan. Are you insane? <laughs> um, it's really, you know, but, but that's where it comes from. And, and actually these farm maps, these 92 farm maps that are in the um, New York City, uh, the Manhattan Borough, President's topographic office, if you knew there was such a thing. Their main job is they, uh, they assign the, the numbers for buildings. That's the main thing they do. But they also have a nice map collection. They have these Randall farm maps, and they're really beautiful maps because they, the farms are the property lines of the second decade of the 19th century. But he's also mapping the streams and the rocks, the natural features. And then he's mapping the street grid that is the street grid that we all know today. And can you imagine that? Can you imagine like, what an act of imagination that is? to put these three things together. And some of those streets weren't built for 100 years. Um, and yet now they are such a fundamental part of the way we think of, of what New York City is. It's so extraordinary. And what if they'd been built with some sense of the original topography? What, how would that have changed the city and all of our relationships to it? Here in the room. Oh, I see yeah. you there. And then I'm coming to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what when uh, New York looked like this, when Henry Hudson came here, what kind of crops were grown, fruits and vegetables? Yeah, so the, the Lenape people grew, grew, grew fields. There's a little bit of debate in the archaeological and anthropology community about how much they depended on, on foods they grew and how much they, they depended on the wild foods because it was so abundant here. Um, but they grew the Three Sisters Garden of corn, beans, and squash, which are all Mesoamerican crops, and that was sort of traded up to here and was you know, very widespread in 17th century North America. So corn, beans, and squash. And why those, particularly those, those crops? Um, it's because you can, you, know, you can plant them in the spring, they'll grow over the summer, and then you, know, you can harvest the corn in August, and then the beans a little bit later. They, they, they planted these climbing beans you know, that would climb on the corn. And then the beans are nitrogen fixing, so they're actually uh, fertilizing the corn. And then the squash you know, has these big leaves, and so it's shaded the soil in between. 
anyway, and then you can, you know, you can collect and then dry them, the corn, the beans, and the squash. So in January, if you don't want to like wade into the harbor and collect oysters and break the ice, you can, you know, you can make succotash instead. Um, yeah. So. Thank you for the talk. Um, you said that a lot of the biodiversity is still here. And so the question would be, is New York today more complex than 400 years ago, however you want to define it? Yeah, yeah. So in terms of species diversity, like the number of species, there's surely more species here now than 400 years ago, mostly because of plant introductions, right? Any gardeners in the room? You know, have you gone through like the native plant list in your garden versus plants from someplace else? Yeah, so there's many more plants, and then many of those have, have escaped. You know, they're spontaneously growing now. Um, and if you go and talk to our friends at the Parks Department who manage natural areas, a lot of their work is handling that, trying to deal with that. Because some of these plants, you know, they're growing outside of the evolutionary context that they evolved in. And so they don't have the same predators, they don't have the same competitors, and they just they kind of grow out of control. Yeah, yeah. And they're very difficult to control, and then they take space from other things that might be here. Um, there's a book, um, uh, Norman Taylor's Botany of, uh, maybe Daniel remembers the exact title, but it, it's basically the plants within some distance in New York City from 1915, and he lists the plants by plant family, and then at the end of each chapter, or each each entry, he has the list of the ballast plants, which are plants of that family that you only find on the ballast piles around the harbor, you know, where, where somebody's, you know, they used to put ballast in the bottom of ships, and then they would dump it out when they didn't need it to put the goods in the ship. And so that was a way of introducing inadvertently all kinds of things to New York City. And he, he put them there because he didn't know if they were going to take, if they were going to survive. I've often thought that's a great PhD for somebody to figure out which one of Taylor's ballast plants actually survived, which ones took and which ones didn't, and why did that, why did that happen? You know, there's all kinds of other stories like this. There was a guy um, in the 19th century who wanted to have all the birds mentioned in Shakespeare in Central Park, and so he brought them. Um, and most famously, starlings were introduced here in Central Park. But what's not often told about that story is it took him three tries. The first two times, all the starlings died, and he had to do it again and again. But the third time they took, and now we have 60 million starlings. <laughs> so, so yeah. So in terms of diversity, but in terms of abundance, everything's down, you know, except for maybe these introduced plants. Yeah, everything's down, you know, as, as Natalie was referring to before. We have time for two more questions. OK, right there. Thanks. Thanks for a wonderful presentation. Can you comment on? Uh, the threat of storm surge versus just rising water table. Mm -hmm. So not just from, um, you know, climate change, sea level rise, but more impervious surfaces. And so I would think all those water features would just become, the buried ones, <laughs> more exaggerated yeah. in the future. And mm -hmm. it seems like a less um, dramatic, less appealing thing or harder thing to address than storm surge. Right, right. So there's, there's the issue of inland flooding, which is a little bit different than storm surge and sea level rise, although there are, are some connections there. So, you know, the, I guess the way I think of this, I, I was once walking around Midtown with a journalist, and, and I said, oh, there's a stream. And he, he's like, where, where, where's the stream? And I said, well, you know, it was raining a little while ago, and you can see it in the gutter there. That's the stream. Because that is what it is, right? Like the, the gutter are our streams going to the storm drain, which are our streams, right? And this infrastructure was built mostly at the end of the 19th and into the early 20th century. And it was built, the pipes are a certain size, right? They weren't thinking about climate change. And now we're having much bigger storms. So um, there was a report from the DEP about a year and a half ago. And they're like, you know, it, we just can't do it. It's going to cost so many hundreds of billions of dollars, and you'd have to rip up the entire city. I mean, can you imagine? Just to make the pipes bigger, and then how big do you make the pipes? So, you know, that, that's why we need other solutions, one of which is, is, you know, less impervious cover, you know. If you think about it, like, we, we've taken our, our forest and landscape, um, which, you know, had trees and vegetation and soil under it, and then we've just made it all covered in rocks, right? <laughs> Like the sidewalk is a kind of rock, and the asphalt is a kind of rock, and this building is a kind of rock. And rocks, they don't absorb water, they, you know, they repel water. And that's why you know, we get all this, these flash floods, basically. And so the more water you get, 
like Hurricane Ida, that was like a month and a half of rain in about a six-hour period in New York City. The city is just not adapted. Even that landscape would have a hard time with that amount of water. Um, so yeah, so that's a, that's a huge issue, and so that's that's why, you know, that's why we have to think about not having so many buildings and maybe doing something else with our road space, right? Um, in some places to try and adapt to climate change. Um, I'm not saying everybody has to go back, everybody has to leave, and we have to make it like that again. I'm just saying we have to be a lot smarter than we ever have been about the way we're modifying the environment. We've just like we've just been kicking this can down the road for so many generations, and now we're inheriting the can, right? <laughs> Um, which is why, you know, like people in my son's generation are just so pissed off, right? And, and don't believe that maybe, you know, can, that's going to happen. Yeah. And then, you know, at some level they're right. Because I think, you know, I think New York City, if you like study the, the way it solves problems, you know, they tend to get to a crisis point and then there's a shift and there's a solution. But that solution is always addressing the problem then for those people. And so often those solutions become the problem for the next generation or the generation after that. And one of the things I think is so great about nature-based solutions and ecological restoration and conservation is that it's actually giving to the future. It's giving options to the future, not taking them away. Um, and then to the, the storm surge thing. So yeah, storm surge is a big issue. There's a nice paper from a couple years ago that says that all the bulkheads and uh, solid walls in the harbor have actually increased the tidal range in New York City. So the high tides are bigger and the low tides are lower because, because there's not this like absorptive capacity of the, of the soft shoreline that we once had. Um, and then you, you take that and then on top of that, the storm surge and the sea level rise. And that's why, that's why somebody, everybody's so concerned. And that's why they're, you know, to Daniel's point, you know, talking about spending billions and billions of dollars to pour cement just everywhere. All right, since this is the last question, let's make it fun. Can, okay. you, can you talk about bugs and rats? I, I, I had heard that there are no flying insects in New York, and I didn't notice them. And then in recent years, I'm noticing mosquitoes and um, flies. And also, I live on the Upper West Side, and there are more rats now. And I heard the rats talk to each other and all moved uptown because of all the flooding. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I have to say I'm not an expert on bugs or rats, but I can assure you there were flying insects in the past and there'll be flying insects in the future. Um, I, I once, uh, a little anecdote, I, I went to, um, when early on in the project, I, you know, I was like developing the ideas and I was thinking, oh, well, you know, there's all these species. And so I started going to like different kinds of scientists and I went to um, my friend Sasha Spector, who's a tiger beetle specialist and he was at the AMNH. And I said, Sasha, hey, you know, we could, we could reconstruct where all the insects were in New York City. And here's how we do it, blah, 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 blah. And then he said, Eric, we can't do that. And I'm like, no, Sasha, think how great it would be. You know, you love insects. Not everybody loves insects, but we could do all the insects. Well, how great would that be? And he's like, Eric, we just can't do it. And I'm like, mm, okay, all right, you know, calm down, take it easy. All right, Sasha, why can't we do it? And he says, Eric, do you know how many insects there are in the world? <laughs> like, you know, you know, like, you know, the inordinate, you know, the, if God loved anything, he loved beetles because there are just so many beetles in the world, right? <laughs> just like, it's crazy. So She. Yeah, she. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, um, and then rats. So rats, you know, these are more introduced species as we were talking about with the plants before. So there weren't any rats here 400 years ago. Um, and actually, if I'm getting this right, there was a brown rat and then the Norway rat. And the, when the Nor rat, when Norway rats came, they actually hunted out all the brown rats and got rid of them. So there's been two waves of rat introductions. And, um, and rats are one of these cosmopolitan species that do very well with people. Um, and to the last question about have they escaped the flooding, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, though. All right, well, let's give a big round of applause to Eric Sanderson. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who also joined us online. I want to just uh, toss out to all of you if you're interested in learning more or coming to our next event. We have um, the EC50 uh, honoree Eric Sedano. EC50 is our initiative to bring in explorers um, that you might not have uh, never heard about um, that are doing amazing things all around the world. Our third cohort will be announced uh, sometime soon. Um, but yes, Eric will be in on Monday, uh, February 6th, um, to talk about the... 
um, Buffalo soldiers who bicycled 1,900 miles from Missoula, uh, Montana to St. Louis, Missouri in 1897. So please come back February 6th for that, 6 p.m. online and in the clock room. Thank you again, Eric. Awesome. And thank you all. Great job. Yeah, no, thank you so much.